uh, let's bow our heads. Father, we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together today and to um, hear your words. Lord, I pray that you'll take this instrument and just put words into my mouth and uh, Lord, that you would help um, that your, your message will be given and that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have a children's story. Do either one of you have a watch? Okay, very good. You don't have it on. But it doesn't do you any good if you don't have it on, does it? How do you know what time it is? Oh, you could you got your sister there, you can ask her, that's right. That's kind of what I do. You notice I don't have a watch either, right? Yeah, well, I, so I ask whoever's around, either that or I check my phone, right? So I see what time it is, right? Is it important to uh, know what time it is? Why do you think? So if you don't know what time it is, you never go to bed, is that right? Okay, so so she knows when. So she knows. So you, your friend comes over, and she knows needs to know what time to come home. And if she didn't know what time it was, she wouldn't be on time coming home, and then she'd get in trouble. Well, that's good. That's uh, so. How many of you think that's a good? Those are good reasons. Okay, you know, I think it, it clocks. How many clocks do you have in your house? Four or five, four or five. Now let me ask you this. This is a personal question. Is your mom and dad ever late? No, your mom is. <laughs> okay, all right, the truth be told. Well, one of the things is I want you to know that Pastor Kevin has last year turned a new leaf and I'm really, because I was consistently had a reputation of being late. How many agree with that? Okay, all right. I've changed my ways, folks. I've changed my ways. And they're clapping for me here. But it's important to have, to be on time, it's important to have a timepiece that's accurate, right? So that you know what time it is so you don't get in trouble. And pastor's always in trouble. Well, lately, I've been really good. But, but I'm trying really hard. So... It's important to have a good timepiece that keeps things so. Did you know that God has a timepiece? Does he have a, you know he has a watch? Did you know that? His timepiece, is it ever, did you ever have a clock that stopped? Maybe the batteries went out, did you? Yeah. And when the clock stops, is it any good? No. Sometimes we think that God's clock may be stopped, right? Because it seems like he's late, maybe. Maybe Jesus' coming is late, you think? Is it late? You don't think so? Well, good for you. Oh, okay. Okay. So how many think that God's clock has stopped? Anybody? Come on. Seems like it sometimes, doesn't it? It does sometimes, yeah. But the point is, it's not, right? It still works. He needs right on time. His clock is right on time, right? So maybe we ought to adjust our clocks to his, right? I know. How do we know? Well, hopefully during the sermon, if you listen, we'll, we'll know what time it is, okay? All right? You can go back to your seat now. It's important. Time is important, isn't it? In fact, these days, it seems like time just drags on as we are going through this COVID, and we think 2020 will never end, right? Well, it will. Time goes on. 
And, and by the way, um, let, me, let me share with you. I read an article the other day that I wanted to share with you. See if I can find it here on my, on my computer. And uh, here it is. There it is. Okay. All right. Have you ever felt like you needed more time? How many of you felt like I could use a little bit more time? Okay. I'm here to give you some good news. You're actually going to get it. Not right away, but you already did. On December 31st, 2016, you got a leap second. You ever heard of that? A leap second was added to the world's clock at 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. Coordinated Universal Time, UTC. This corresponds to 6.59.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. When the extra second will be inserted at the U.S. Naval Observatory Master Clock Facility in Washington, D.C., this is the 27th leap second added to the UTC, a uniform time scale kept by atomic clocks around the world since 1972. Did you know that? I didn't know any of this. Historically, time was based on the mean rotation of the Earth, not the, not the angry mean kind of thing, but the average rotation of the, of the Earth. So that's where historically we've, how we've kept time. You know, seconds, minutes, days, was all a division of, you know, one day. So, however, the invention of the atomic clocks defined a much more precise atomic time scale, a second that is independent of the Earth's rotation. In 1970, an international agreement established two time scales, one based on the rotation of the Earth and one based on the atomic clock. And atomic clocks do not use radioactivity, so don't worry, it's not damaging any environment or any people. But they do use the exact frequency of the microwave spectral line emitted by the atoms. Anybody understand that? Does it go right over your head? Some of you might. But anyway, it's about the frequency of the, of the half-life of the atoms, uh, element cesium. It's the isotope of atomic weight of 133. And so they use that, that, uh, that sequence, that, uh, that, time, that frequency. The problem is, in these, why there's such a, a, a difference between the two clocks is the problem is that the Earth's rotation is very gradually slowing down. Did you know that? We're kind of slowly slowing down, which necessitates a periodic insertion of the leap second into the atomic time scale to keep the two within one second of each other. So, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service is the organization which monitors the difference in the two time scales and calls for the leap seconds to be inserted or removed when necessary. But I want to let you know, to your own relief, that they're not going to add a second to 2020. Isn't that great? So 2020 will end. They won't add another second to it. So in 1972, leap seconds have been added at intervals varying between six months and seven years with the last being inserted December 31, 2016. And the U.S. Naval Observatory is charged with the responsibility for the precise determination and dissemination of time for the Department of Defense and maintains its master clock. Aren't you glad that in Washington, D.C., they have a master clock that you can set your time to? And the U.S. Naval Observatory, together with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, determines the time for the United States. Huh. I feel very secure now that we have this accuracy in time. Did you know that God has a master timepiece? It's the timepiece that runs the universe. And it's never wrong. And it's always on time. If you turn with me, if you have your Bibles with you or your phones, 
to Galatians chapter 4, reading verses 4 through 7. This tells us about the time, God's clock. Galatians 4, 4 through 7, if you have it there. Starting with verse 4 of chapter 4 of Galatians. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons and daughters. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, or Dear Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are son, God has made you also an heir. In Luke chapter 1, 19, it says, At their proper time, the angel Gabriel came and announced John the Baptist's birth. In fact, in Desire of Ages, page 32, it says, But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus came and was born in Bethlehem. God's clock is right on time. Amen? You may be late, like me, or you may be on time, whatever, but God is never late, and yet he's never early. He's right on time. My wife likes to be early. How many of you like to be early? She said, how long is it going to take to get to such and such place? And I will always say, oh, it's about this much. No, exactly. Well, how long is it going to take us? And after I tell her how long it's going to take us, you know what she adds? She adds another half hour to it. She knows me too well. I don't have a good sense of time. And I appreciate that God has brought her in my life because she tries really hard to help me get on time. One time we went to a wedding and we were two hours early. And I said, you won't listen to me. It was going to take that much time. She says, well, now we can go to dinner together. So she used that to her advantage. But God's clock is never too fast and it's never too slow. It's always on time. In fact, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 it says for the revelation awaits an appointed time it speaks of the end and will not prove false though it lingers wait for it it will certainly come it will not delay the God who created light and time is the only constant in the universe turn with me to the book of Daniel Daniel 9 and we're going to go briefly through and we can go, this is very complicated. How many of you are good at math? Any of you good at math? Okay, some of you are good at math. Well, follow with us. If you're not, we'll, follow, we'll try to get you through this. Daniel 9, in Daniel 9 is the, one of the greatest time prophecies of the Bible. Because in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, it was revealed to Daniel by the angel the exact year and time of when Jesus would come or would be anointed for his work on this world, in this world. So Daniel 9 is the 70 week prophecy. How many of you have heard of this prophecy? Any of you heard of this prophecy? Well, if you haven't, bear with me as we go through it quickly. This prophecy, as you see on your screen, this is the chart here that we have. And I wanna share with you this 70 week prophecy as you see it there on your screen. So in Bible prophecy, one of the things that you can count on is, is that, that um, and this is not, I'm not giving you anything that hasn't been used before. I'm not, this, I'm not the originator of this. This interpretation has been from the, the time of the, uh, uh, the reformers all the way to today. A day in Bible prophecy equals a year. Okay, just remember that a day in Bible prophecy equals a year. You find that in Numbers 1434. It says according to the number of days. Now this is in Numbers 14. It tells the story of the spies who went into Canaan and, and were spying out the land for 40 days. For every year that they, for every day that they were in 
uh, the land of Canaan, spying it out. God said, I'm going to send you back out in the wilderness. And uh, you, for each day that they were in there will be a year for you out in the wilderness. So according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you will bear your iniquity for 40 years. Again, in Ezekiel 4, 6, it says, 40 days I assign you a day for each year. So 70 weeks, 70 times 7 would be how much, you mathematicians? Huh? 490. So 490 days would equal 490 years, right? 490 years. So turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and this is where we pick it up. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, and to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore, he continues, the angel talking to Daniel, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks and it shall be built in troublous times. One of the things is, is you could have a period of time, but if you don't have a starting date, then it really is meaningless. Well, the angel gives Daniel a starting position. By knowing, therefore, he says, and understand that the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, while Daniel was in Babylon and his city, Jerusalem, was destroyed. And so he said, the angel says, when this decree goes out, then you'll know that's the beginning of the 490 years. Do we know when this decree went out? Well, there was actually three decrees that went out by the Persians. First with Cyrus and then with his uh, uh, descendants. They were three, but we know the third one, the last one, was in 457 B.C. So if you go 69 weeks, because that's what it said, going forth there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks which is 69 so that's 69 of the 70 he says and which would be 483 years so the 69 weeks is 483 years which takes us to AD 27 you can see on the chart there from 457 to AD 27 is 483 years now the interesting thing about this is that you know that there was no zero year between BC and AD it went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. So that's why if you go 483, uh, and remember, B.C. goes down, and then A.D. goes up, right? So I know this is very confusing. But I want to tell you this, and the reason I'm sharing with you is that how accurate God's timepiece is. In fact, God knows he's... God says he is the great I am, which means that he's ever present. So if you were a great time traveler and you could go all the way into the past or all the way into the future, whatever you're at, wherever you're at in time, God is there. He's ever present. And so when God knows the future, he can tell you exactly with his timepiece what will happen exactly on time. What happened in AD 27? That's the question. Well, Luke records in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, it says, In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, okay, we know when the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was in records, in history, and it was A.D. 27. And so Jesus also, during that time, was baptized at that time. You can re see that in the chapter 3 of uh, the book of Luke. Jesus was baptized. He was also turned 30 years of age at that time, which was the age in which a person was now considered uh, old enough to be a rabbi or a teacher. Okay? So he began his work. So Jesus was anointed by baptism for his mission to earth as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, right on time, just as God had said. Now, Daniel says in the midst of this last week, the 70th week, he would be cut off. And if you continue to read that 70-week prophecy, it says that he would be cut off, but not for himself, 
and he would put an end to sacrifices. Well, three and a half years later, from AD 27, three and a half years later to the spring of AD 31, Jesus was crucified. And his sacrifice was not for himself, it was for you and me. And Luke records that the veil that divided the holy place from the most holy place in the temple was torn from top to bottom by unseen hands when Jesus died, putting an end to the sacrificial system of animal sacrifices right on time. In fact, in AD 70, the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, and it was permanently uh, destroyed, that system of animal sacrifices. So... That leaves in this last week of the 70 weeks, the 70th week, three and a half more years. So the three and a half years of the rest of the week was the last appeal to the Jewish people to accept Jesus as the Messiah by his disciples. But at the end of the three and a half years, the book of Acts records something significant. The disciple Stephen was stoned, cried and stoned for his faith in Jesus. You can read that in the book of Acts. And one of the witnesses was there holding the people's coats that were stoning Stephen was a man named Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted the disciples of Jesus until one day on his way to Damascus to hunt down and find these disciples of Jesus, he was blinded by a bright light and Jesus spoke to him from heaven and said, why are you persecuting me, Saul? and told him that he had been chosen to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And no longer was his name Saul, but it was changed to Paul, taking the Paul, the apostle, to the Gentiles. And so now the good news of salvation through Jesus was given to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. All of this, just as God's time clock had said it would happen. Remember in Jesus' life, he would always say, my time is not yet, my time is not yet. He always was on God's time clock. So what I want to share with you, if you have a good, if you want to set your clock to the time in Washington, D.C., uh, then you're going to be uh, on time around the things of this world. But the most important clock that you need to be concerned about and I need to be concerned about is God's clock, his prophetic clock, because everything will happen on time. Jesus came to this earth for the first time right on time, just as God said it would happen. It was ripe for him. There was one government in the then known world, one language, and the gospel could go like wildfire. When Jesus comes, listen to me, but Jesus' second time he comes, I want you to know that Jesus' second coming will be right on time. Do we know the time? It's amazing. We don't know the day or the hour, but listen to what, what Paul says in Thessalonians. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Thessalonians. Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay? Now concerning the times and the season. That's what we're talking about, right? Brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Verse 2. This is chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Does that mean he will come secretly or unexpectedly? How many believe that it is secretly? Anybody? How about unexpectedly? Okay, that's what it means. He will come unexpectedly when we don't, when we least expect it. But listen to what he says. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Then he talks to the people in the Thessalonia, the, the believers. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Right? You don't have to be surprised. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us put our timepiece 
and, in, and put it together with God's timepiece. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, and having put on the breastplate of faith and love, which is, which is good works and righteousness, doing good things. And for the, a helmet, the hope of salvation. These are all important things in God's timepiece. For God has not dis destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, and so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. My friends, God's timing is perfect. It will happen just as he said. Jesus said that he would come again. When Adam and Eve sinned, the plan of salvation began. The clock for our salvation began to tick. So walk through me briefly with the Old Testament predictions of Jesus' first coming. In Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, the seed of Adam and Eve, was promised that would come. Genesis 12.3, through this seed, all nations would be blessed, Abraham was told. In Genesis 49.10, it says the scepter will not depart from Judah. That's what Jacob told. In Numbers 24, 17, Balaam prophesied that a star would come out of Jacob. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, Moses said the Lord would raise up a prophet like unto himself. In Psalms 22, Jesus' death was described by David in detail. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, Isaiah says that it would be the Messiah would come as a, a, a virgin birth, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Isaiah uh, 9, 6 says he would be called the Prince of Peace. Unto us a child is born. And Isaiah 11, 1, he would be the root and the branch of David. And Isaiah 53 predicted that he would be the suffering Messiah. And Jeremiah 23, 5, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah says, the righteous branch. In Daniel 9.25, which we would just read, he was the Messiah, the prince. And Zechariah 9.9 9 says, your king comes riding on a donkey. All of these prophecies were fulfilled right on time. In fact, Micah 5 says that he would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. My friends, this is the season we celebrate the coming of Jesus to earth the first time to redeem us. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling with us. We have seen His glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But as surely as God's clock struck for the time of Jesus to come the first time, we can also celebrate the fact that His second coming will be right on time. Amen? Jesus promised. John 14, 1 through 3, I will come again. Acts 1, 11, the angel said, he will come back. And Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, Paul assures us, we will raise up and meet him in the air. In 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, Peter encourages, God is not late, Jesus will come on time. In Revelation 22, 12, Jesus promised, behold, I come quickly. You know, in these days, <laughs> our world is going really crazy. I think as Christians, it's most important for us this time of year to remember that Jesus came on time the first time. He will be here on time the second time. But sometimes we think that God's clock may be stopped. It seems like it keeps going on and on. But 2 Peter 3, 8, 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting that any should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Even though it seems sometimes that God's clock is not running, it is. It is right on time. It is right on time. But not everyone was ready to receive Jesus when he came the first time. How about, the question is, how about the second time? 
Are people ready to receive him again? Are you ready to receive him? You know, the American uh, Optometric Association says that in total darkness, now listen to this, this blows your mind. In a total darkness, which is hard to get because of our world is so lit up at night, but total darkness, the sensitive human eye can see the faint light of a candle over 14 miles away. Did you know that? In complete darkness, that a person could see with a human eye 14 miles away a little flicker of a candle. John 1 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. You know, you and I are used to the darkness of this world. You know, Ellen White said one time when she was in vision how dark this world seemed. She kept repeating over, it's so dark, it's so dark. We are so used to that darkness. God could not bring us into his full presence. We would be too fearful or blinded. So he sent Jesus veiled in human flesh so that we could behold his presence and glory. Jesus, the light of the world, came into this dark, dark world so that our spiritual eyes might recognize him as the light of the world. In verse 12 of chapter 1 of John, it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want to share a story. Years ago, there was a serious coal mining accident in the Allegheny Mountains. And many miners escaped the cave, uh, but three were trapped somewhere deep in the earth. Nobody knew if they were dead or alive. I can't imagine what it would be like to go down into the earth like that I don't know if any of you are claustrophobic, but I don't know if I could ever be a coal miner. Uh, being down in the depths of the earth there and then have the, you know, your escape uh, is gone. Um, nobody knew if they were dead or alive down there. Three men. Two days passed before a search expedition is a, was allowed to re-enter the mine. Two days they had to spend in that total darkness. Whether they had lights or not, I don't know, but I don't batteries don't last that long but the local news station with their cameras interviewed the rescue team and a reporter asks one of the men if he was aware of the extreme danger and even the danger of noxious gases that may be trapped in the mine and the the rescuer said yes and then the reporter asked him are you still going down there with all of that risk and the man replied, those men may still be alive, may still be alive. And with that, he put on his gear, climbed into the elevator, and descended into the darkness of the mind. Talk about heroes. I wonder if that was the discussion that went on into heaven when Jesus made his decision to come to this world. I wonder. I wonder if that time the time that God had said, it's time to go. It's time to go. To come to this earth as a child on that Christmas Eve. Maybe the question was, do you know the danger and risk? Maybe one of the angels asked Jesus, do you know the danger and risk of going down there? And Jesus answered, yes. And you're still going down? And Jesus going down to a world of indescribable darkness where few will listen except the good news. And the angel asked, are you still going down? To be despised and rejected by men? To become a man of sorrows acquainted with grief? To be cursed and become sin? And to give your life? I'm thankful that Jesus answered, yes. Yes to this 
his giving up his sovereignty for swaddling clothes and diapers. His give up his throne for an animal feeding trough. His giving up his omnipotence for human flesh. Giving up his glory for slander and shame. Giving up his, his essence of eternal life in order to suffer eternal death. My friends, Jesus came into the darkness to rescue you and me. And now, he promises to come again and to take us with him out of this darkness into his presence forever. Amen? Just as surely as God's clock is on time, Jesus will come again right on time, my friends. Even so, I pray, come Lord Jesus. My friends, I invite you, keep your eyes fixed on the light of the world. Make Jesus your focus every single day. And keep your clocks on God's timepiece, not your own. God's clock is on time and he's going to return and be here shortly. And that's what I hope for. So keep hanging on hoping that Jesus will return on time and uh, be ready to, to hear him when he comes and to go home with him. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we are so grateful and thankful. We pray that you will please be with, uh, be with us each as we continue to go through these times and these holidays and remember that Jesus came on time and he will come back again on time. Help us to keep holding on to that through these crazy times. And help us to minister to one another, Lord. I pray that you will help us to, to keep in touch with one another and to, and to share in, in this good news of your soon return with neighbors and friends that may be around us. Help us to keep doing good things for people around us and, and ministering to them. And, and Lord, know that your clock is still ticking. I pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.